Good afternoon and welcome to the Cal Botterill Legacy Lecture. Of course, virtual again here in 2021. And uh, we've had a long history with the Cal Botterill Legacy Lecture Series. And my name is Michelle Sawatsky Coop, and I've had the incredible honor of hosting so many of these evenings. In fact, I can hardly remember missing one because when you miss a Cal Botterill Legacy Lecture, you miss getting to know some incredible human. And today we're going to get to know three incredible human beings and uh, happens to be three incredible women. Now, my background with Cal goes back to 1996 and before that. Uh, that was the Olympics I participated in and Cal was our sports psychologist uh, with our team, uh, with the National Women's Volleyball Team before we headed to Atlanta. And um, I think whenever you play sport at that level, there are always challenges that can seem unsurmountable and things that come in your way and, and seem to block your path. And that's where Cal came in for us, really helped us not only survive, but thrive in that environment. And ever since then, Cal and I have had a very special relationship that way. And uh, he was sort of that extra factor, you know, athletes train hard and the physical part of things and all of that. And um, Cal just came alongside of us and made it possible for us to do what we really wanted to do. So when Cal retired from his work teaching at the University of Winnipeg, uh, we started this legacy lecture series. Dr. Adrian Leslie Tugood, super instrumental in making all of this happen, uh, was a big part of it even back then. And in 2007, we started it because when Cal was teaching at the U of W, he always went to great efforts to bring people in, professionals in to Manitoba, to reach all of us, um, to be able to further what we knew about um, psychology and sport and performance and, and all of that, and, and health and wellness through sport. And so to keep that alive, the Legacy Lecture Series was born. And it's an annual event. And um, we really want to honor that tradition. And I hope it keeps going for a very, very long time. Before we get to our panel and an incredible discussion, I want to tell you guys um, about the Jim Henderson Dedicated Service Award. Now, this award is handed out every year as well. And uh, the award is presented to someone in the health and performance psychology world in the field. And uh, it's presented to a professional with a distinguished history of service provision. Now, Jim Henderson himself, I have to say, I, I wish you could meet him today. I wish uh, you could see him walk across the stage like he has so many times. And the story of Jim Henderson is an incredible one. And I asked Cal Botterill himself to give me some of his thoughts on Jim uh, in, in the introduction to this award. And here's what Cal said. These are actually in Cal's words. Jim Henderson is the ultimate testimony to health and performance psychology. He was the principal of the University of Winnipeg Collegiate and was taking my sports psychology class when an automobile accident changed his life forever. The story of his recovery to a meaningful life is totally inspiring. Jim's human spirit, his family and therapist brought him back for us to learn from. We love you, Jim, for being you and for inspiring us all, Cal. So just those few words tells you how important this award is and how special it is. And it gives me great pleasure to announce to you the winner of the Jim Henderson Dedicated Service Award in Health and Performance Psychology is Mr. Craig Brown. Now, Craig is an incredible individual. He immigrated to Winnipeg in the fall of 2018 uh, from Jamaica and is a permanent resident of Canada. He had a previous career in business and finance, so you might sort of think he had it made that way, but due to his passion for sport and youth, he wanted to make a change and he made a huge change indeed. Craig is a dedicated and meticulous student. Uh, he earned A plus grades in all of his studies and exploring the experiences of newcomer varsity athletes is novel, and extremely timely and something that Craig is super passionate about. Anti-racism in sport is a campaign that he has worked on uh, with Bison Sports related to equity, diversity and inclusion. This young man is gonna make huge waves in this whole world, in the health and performance psychology world. And we are so excited to be able to announce that. Craig Brown is our Jim Henderson Award 
winner. Congratulations, Craig, and thanks for all that you have done. All right, and now I have the great honor to move us to the panel, what so many of you have joined us for, and uh, we're going to learn so much today. I, I have to say, I, I would be remiss to say, uh, if I didn't say, that I'm super excited that we have three incredible women. Three incredible women who are professional athletes, who are making their living with sport, who have changed their worlds in so many ways. So one by one, let me introduce you. So first, uh, we'll talk to Emily Potter. Emily is the first Manitoban ever drafted into the WNBA and currently playing professional basketball in Greece. She left her practice to join us today. Emily, welcome to the panel. Thank you for joining us all the way from Greece. Thank you so much for having me. So glad we could make it, make it work, made it here. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. <laughs> awesome. I guess it's not snowing and blowing in Greece. No, it's a, uh, it's a warm 18 and you'd think it's like two degrees the way people dress out here. They're not used <laughs> to the cold. <laughs> I'd like to see them here today. Anyway, <laughs> welcome. And, and we're going to get to know you in, in just a little bit. Of course, then we have Leah Kirchman, two-time Olympic cyclist, currently racing with a team out of the Netherlands. And uh, she's in Ontario right now. Welcome uh, to the panel, Leah. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited for this conversation. Leah, I think I'm really, I, I'm so excited to hear your story and to have you share it because I think cycling sometimes get, gets lost in the mainstream of sports. And when people hear what you have actually been doing and how you've been representing Canada, but also women in sport, I'm super excited for you to share that. And we're going to get to that. And then Desiree Scott. Well, Desiree, you know, three-time Olympic medalist. Most recently, you guys, uh, change the color of the medals you received before and you made it gold. Uh, so proud to call you Manitoban, all three of you. Desiree, welcome to the panel. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Oh, my pleasure to be here. Looking forward to it for sure. Right on. Um, okay, so I, I guess we'll start, you know, maybe we'll start with you, Leah. Uh, you know, what I'd like you each to do is tell, tell us a little bit about your journey and where it all started for you. And then um, may, make sure you get to what you're doing right now and, and where you're at right now. So Leah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah, so my journey started back in Manitoba. Um, Winnipeg, born and raised. My family still lives there. So I love my Manitoba roots. Um, yeah, so I guess I come from a really active family. Um, my first sport was actually cross country skiing because we all know you have to do something in the winter in Winnipeg. Um, so we were really into that and I was racing and a lot of the endurance community is kind of a lot of the same people. Um, so it was actually our family friends that suggested that I try out cycling as a cross training activity. And so I joined the Kids in Mud program um, when I was 13 years old as just something to do in the summer. And I was really hooked on cycling almost right away because it was so fun. Like you got to race in the mud. I was beating some of the boys and I thought that was really fun. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just really loved cycling. Um, and it was at that time too, the, the provincial coach was always trying to get more girls into cycling since it is a more male dominated sport. And he saw an opportunity with me there. Um, so quickly also got me onto a road bike and soon I found myself racing the whole series and starting to travel outside the province and doing more and more. Um, but it did take a while to choose a sport to focus on. I did keep ski racing into well cycling and doing road and mountain bike um, throughout my whole youth. Um, and then finally, after you know, I left Manitoba to go to university in BC and after first year university, I thought, okay, now it's time to focus on one sport and specialize. And that's when I decided to focus on road cycling. Um, I saw there was opportunities with lots of teams and I think I had skills and strength I demonstrated to, to try that out full time. Um, and yeah, I guess from there, I, my philosophy has always been just to, yeah, just to keep improving and work on my weaknesses and look at what that next level is. Um, so after racing for some local teams for a few years, I managed to sign my first professional contract when I was 20, um, and raced primarily in the American, uh, circuit. Uh, and during that time, I also started doing some projects with Team Canada and would travel to Europe and do, you know, a few weeks of racing here and there over there and kind of 
learned what that world was like and it was a big shock and I had to learn a lot. Um, but yeah, so I was racing professionally and then in 2016, um, I then joined uh, the team that I'm currently racing for. It's a European team um, called Team DSM. It's changed names over the years, um, but that's, yeah, I guess currently where I am. But it's a lot, of, yeah, there's a lot to cover for a, a lot of years. So if I miss something, you can ask me. <laughs> Okay. Well, but how did you even know? How did you even know how to get into the whole professional ranks as a, as a female cyclist? Like, was there, did you have a mentor? Did you have someone that led you to that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I think I did benefit from having good mentors around me and showing me what paths existed. Um, and like the way if I think now of how I actually got my first professional contract, it was having this opportunity to travel with this team down to the States and race in this big race and really having someone there was advocating for me and, you know, bringing me to the teams and talking to them and really encouraging me to put myself out there. Um, so for sure, having some, having people, um, yeah, backing me up was, was very helpful in my career. Well, totally. And what, was there anyone that sort of went before you from Canada that, that walked that path? I think there, yeah, the Canada has had some quite successful uh, cyclists, both female and male, and also from Winnipeg. Winnipeg has produced some amazing cyclists, which <laughs> everyone always asks why. And I think it's because it creates such tough athletes, you know, we're training in these weather conditions and it's so flat and it's so windy. And like, you have to be tough if you're going to make it as a, a cyclist from Winnipeg. Um, so we've had, yeah, those, those people, I think that came before me were, were very inspiring. Um, and you know, athletes like, yeah, seeing Claire Hughes on the, as an example of someone who was inspiring to me. For sure. For yeah. sure. And I'm sure we're going to touch on more parts of your story as we ask the questions. So thanks for sharing. Um, just incredible, like not a common story we hear. And um, I, one more thing I have to ask you, uh, like, so you're in Ontario now, you're, you're cycling with a team from Netherlands. Do you just go back and forth or how does it work? Yeah, I'm all over the place. <laughs> so, during the season, I'm based in Europe. Um, and yeah, with the pandemic, I, I spent a lot less time in Canada, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, usually during the season, I go back and forth a bit and, and try to find some balance there. Yeah, yeah and real quick, what, what is your season? What is the cycling season? It's getting longer and longer. <laughs> it could start in February to October. Wow. So quite long. Cool, cool. Emily, let's go to you. I mean, you know what? You just came off the court, so you're right in the thick of things, playing pro. Uh, that's like a dream come true. I mean, that would be a dream come true for so many young athletes and, and uh, so many that are, that are watching right now are going, okay, I want to know how she did that. Well, first of all, if you could see Emily stand up, you would know she's like six foot five. <laughs> I think if you reverse those numbers, you got me. But anyways, um, so Emily, talk about your roots in basketball. Lots of young athletes play basketball. It's a mainstream school sport. Was it always basketball for you? Give us a little bit of your journey. Yeah, everyone in my family pretty much played basketball. Obviously, I come from a tall family. Everyone else is tall and played basketball. You know, at least in high school, I have an older sister who played university in Manitoba. Um, but I grew up you know, playing a lot of other sports. I played, you know, soccer was not good at that. I did, you know, some like track running. I did ringette for a lot of years oh. and I was obsessed with that. Um, and I started playing basketball and volleyball when I was in junior high. So I was 12 years old and it was kind of a natural progression to kind of, I guess, lean towards the court sports because that's, you know, what my family had done and definitely would have more of a competitive advantage playing volleyball or basketball than, you know, some other sports. Um, but when I started, I was very bad. <laughs> I was 5'11 in the seventh grade and not very coordinated. And I just remember my first couple years, just like only working on like skills and fundamentals. I still remember like learning how to do a layup. And I was so excited when I finally nailed the footwork. So for me, having that foundation of like skills really helped me uh, moving forward. And from there, Throughout high school, we have, you know, the provincial team program, which is the highest level you can play, you know, in high school in our province. And that helped me get exposure to play then in college. And I'm very 
lucky that basketball is a sport where you can get a full ride scholarship and go play. So I played in the NCAA at the University of Utah. And that was an amazing experience um, to play in the Pac-12 against other great athletes, get my education, travel to so many places. Um, and then from there, now I've been professional. This is my fourth year as a professional. So I've played in Poland, the Czech Republic, and now I'm in Greece. Definitely happy with where I'm at, it's living in Greece. <laughs> Needed a little switch up, a little new location. Um, so it's been nice to find that balance of playing pro um, and living, you know, the nice weather here in Greece. Mm -hmm. um, but along the way, you know, I've played with a national team. That's something that's always super important to me. And anytime I get a call up with them, it's great. The first time I had a try out there, I think I was like 16. So I worked my way kind of through the, the age group system with that. Um, and the senior team is still like my goal with Canada basketball. Um, and yeah, so here I am. Yeah. You know, I think I'm for living the life exactly living the dream we always say yeah anyway um but but emily through your story too um i think some people and, and maybe maybe us little people hey desiree who just really battled in sport um we might think well you're so lucky they must have all just worked for you it must have been so easy for you and i think it's important for athletes to know that just because you have maybe one ingredient that everyone wants it wasn't always easy for you i mean there were injuries along the way talk a maybe just just touch on a little bit the the challenges you faced, even, you know, being blessed with what a lot of people want, it's still a road. It's still a journey. Yeah, for sure. And I find myself looking at other athletes and I'm like, it looks so perfect from the outside. It looks like they have no struggles at all. And I feel like I've felt I've faced struggles all along the way, but people often, you know, don't always see that side. And I've had, you know, I've torn my ACL. I've had three knee surgeries. I've been cut from so many teams. Like just because I'm at the level I'm at doesn't mean I haven't been cut numerous times from teams, cut from the WNBA, cut from the Canadian national team. Um, had to leave a team professionally because I was injured. So it's not always fantastic and you're not always winning as well. It's not always great. Um, but it's those times where, I don't know, you kind of see what you're made of in those moments. And every time I've faced a struggle or adversity, it's just made me realize that this is still the path I want to take. And I want to get back to being as best as I can be. That's super cool. Okay. Well, Desiree, I mean, a mountaintop moment in Tokyo, we were all watching. I, mean, I was having a heart attack watching you. Why did you guys do that to us? But anyway, it was amazing. So amazing. But that was like that one great moment. I mean, it was a, a long moment because it was the whole game was great. And the whole Olympics was great. I know there's so much more to your story. And, um, you know, I I think everyone needs to hear all these stories. So Desiree, bring us back to Winnipeg, you know, uh, like, like Leah and Emily, really, I think it's so cool that we can say that. And here you are from a small prairie province and an Olympic gold medalist. Um, uh, tell us how it started for you. Were you always a soccer player? Were you one of those little cute little soccer players? For the Timbits? Yeah, no, I, I was a bit of a, a late bloomer. I love that. I just love hearing the stories of Manitobans. I find I wear Winnipeg and Manitoba on my chest and I find often athletes from here have to always like kind of rep the province a bit more because Winnipeg gets a bad rep. So it's cool to be on this call and see such powerful, successful women in sport. It's very cool. So just wanted to give that shout out to the crew here. Um, but no, I started playing when I was eight years old, um, had an older brother who didn't want to hang out with me at all. Um, but something we bonded over was like on the soccer field, we would go outside, he would kick the ball with me. I would go and watch his games and I was kind of like, I just want to be like my big brother. And that was kind of how I fell in love with the sport. My dad played, my brother played, and then I sort of just followed again within the family, the ranks and that. Um, was very competitive from a very early age. I was like still 5'1", very short, but like had a little Afro and that aggressive mentality, hated to lose. Um, so from an early age, I like just fell in love with soccer. Um, and I kind of just, as I said, proud Winnipegger went through the Winnipeg ranks. I played on for FC Northwest in the West end of the city, um, started playing sort of competitive division one sort of soccer when I was 13. Um, and yeah, just sort of just ticked away, ticked away. Luckily had an amazing support system. My mom drove me to every training session, every tournament. She didn't miss a game that was here. Um, had fantastic coaches who saw sort of something special in me that maybe at times I didn't see in myself. And obviously as you're going through those teen years, you want to go to the parties and hang with your friends. But, um, at 13, you kind of have to start committing to the sport. If you want to be on the provincial teams and start being recognized for 
the look to maybe go for a youth national team. Um, and I kind of got my first start with the youth national team when I was 14. And I got scouted because of a uh, club nationals with representing Manitoba. So um, kudos to Manitoba for like having my back and being part of my story. And, and the reason I got involved with Canada and um, started playing for the national team, youth national team when I was 14. I'm 34 now, despite this baby face. Um, and still representing my country, which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, I just, again, just carried through the provincial team systems in and out of the youth team systems, um, ended up saying no to a senior national team camp. That's obviously the goal, the full team, um, as Emily said. Um, but I said, no, I had a one week window between youth team and a national team camp where I got asked to go. And I was like, I could either go home for that week or I could go to the senior team and I'm a homebody through and through. So I just said, no. And I'm like, I need time at home because I'd been away for three months with the youth team. So I said, no, and the national team coach said, you'll never play for the senior team ever again. You don't say no to me. And so I was kind of like, well, I guess that's it. Like I was kind of stubborn and again, a big homebody. So I was like, I'll come home and I'll try and get a university scholarship and play soccer. And hopefully that will work out for me. And the year I graduated high school in 2005, the University of Manitoba Bison started their inaugural season for soccer at the U of M. So it was kind of just like it came full circle. I could play at home in front of my family and friends every weekend, get a quality education in my backyard. I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. Um, so played five years as a Manitoba Bison. Very, very proud. Looking back, I'm like, how did I manage that school and sport? It was ridiculous. Um, I probably couldn't do it now. And yeah, and then again, at a senior club nationals in Saskatchewan of all places, uh, a national team coach was there in the stands. I wasn't meant to play. I had actually pulled my quad and I was out with a bag of ice around my quad and they made an announcement over the loudspeak and they said, Carolina Marache is in the stands, senior national team coach. And so my coach and I looked at each other and he's like, you got to play. And I was like, oh man. So I strapped up my leg, took a couple of Tylenol and I was like, okay, let's go give it the best 45 minutes, half you can do. And I went out, um, played quite well, and the coach talked to me afterwards, and that was kind of when I got my, my look into the senior team. In 2010 was my first cap with the national team, um, and it's now 2021, so I've had a decade or so with the senior team, and it's been the most incredible ride. Um, again, not, not to say there wasn't any you know, trials and tribulations. You know, you're playing for your country. Everyone just kind of sees the Canada on your chest, but there's a lot of things that goes behind the doors and that, you know, us as athletes don't show all the time because we have, what we have to do is be so resilient and so strong and sort of just put one foot in front of the other. But I'm sure all of us have those stories that are just, that we look back on and say, wow, we, we achieved something massive because of what we had gone through. So again, just through the Manitoba system, representing my country, I'm playing professionally in Kansas city right now. I've been playing pro for seven years. Um, and now I'm just back in Winnipeg for the off season, lovely snow weather, not grease weather. Um, and yeah, I'm here for a couple months until I decide what's next. So before we get to all of our questions, Desiree, I do have to ask you about that. No, I think so many athletes, parents, coaches, we're, we're so afraid to say no. And I really think that if it's, if it's meant to be, and you continue to put in the work another door will open and, and, and you know what, maybe it wouldn't have opened any way for you if it wasn't really meant to be. Um, you were still giving your all still playing the sport. I, I just, I, I want to just, how did you have the nerve in that moment? Did you say, well, that's fine. If I never play national team, I'll be okay. Were you okay with that? Or, or, you know, I'm, I'm amazed by the no, that, that just, it, it really amazes me. Cause I talk to a lot of young athletes and they say, what should I do? What should I do in different scenarios? And rarely do we suggest saying no. No, for sure. I think I definitely took a risk with, with the no. Um, but again, I'm, I pride myself in being true to myself and making sure I have that balance between being, you know, a high performance athlete, but also at family and being at home was important to me. And I, I knew in that moment I needed to be home. I wouldn't have been my best self going into that national team camp without having that sort of break. So I just said, stay true to you, say no. And what's meant to be will be, I obviously had chats with my mom and you know, my, my family and coaches, and they just said, do what you think is best and just sort of live with the decision. So it was a risk. Um, but I, at the time that was what I needed. 
I love that. Well, you knew what you needed and that made you your best self. And then when you were ready, you were more ready to go. Right. I mean, that's great for people to hear, you know, don't jump the gun. If it's not right for you or you're exhausted or something, you're mentally, you need that time with your family. It can make you even stronger in the end. Um, as I go into the questions that I have for these, these amazing panel, uh, feel free to add your questions in the chat. If you would like to ask any one of them or all three of them a question, I'll keep my eye on the chat box for sure. And, um, and we'll, We'll try to get to them if we can, um, but also we'll run through some questions. And if you just want to sit back and listen, uh, continue to do so. Uh, one of the questions I have, uh, and Leah, I'll ask you, um, what did you learn and what have you learned about yourself through sport? Yeah, I think I've, I've just learned so much about myself through sport. <laughs> um, I guess the biggest thing is that I just love taking on really big challenges. And I love to work with like-minded people towards big goals. Um, and that's something that you can do so well through sport. Um, yeah, and that I'm always just I'm striving to get the best out of myself and those around me. Those are the biggest things. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Emily, what about you? I mean, through the challenges that you've had and, and all of that, and then the successes that you've had and what you're experiencing now, um, you know, what have you learned about what you need, what you need? to be your best. Desiree touched on it. You know, that time with family was something she needed at the time. Um, Emily, what do you need to be your best right now where you're at? Yeah, I need, a, I need a lot of things. And it's taken, you know, me growing up to realize that and to figure out for me, um, professionally as a basketball player, it's not all about the money for me. Like, um, if I wanted to make, you know, a million dollars, I'd probably pick a different profession <laughs> being a female basketball player, but I do it because I love it. And so for me being here in Greece, um, it's about finding a good team dynamic, finding a good work life balance. If I'm just in a Northern European country where it's cold, there's nothing to do. All I'm seeing is the inside of my apartment and the inside of the gym, I'm not gonna be happy. I'm also a super big homebody and it's hard when I'm away for eight months of the year, nine hour, eight hour time difference from home. Yeah. So for me, it's been a learning process to figure out what works for me. Um, and a big thing for me is just staying on top of my own wellness physically and mentally, instead of waiting until I'm feeling down or I'm starting to feel like, okay, things aren't going well. I'm not, you know, thriving in a new place. You need to stay on top of all the things that make you feel healthy and well, while you're still feeling well. Like why, why do you need to wait till you're on E? My mom always tells me, don't let your gas tank go underneath a quarter of my car. She always tells that always keep your gas tank. If it's a quarter full, you need to fill it up. And it's honestly a great analogy for life as well. Like don't wait till you're all the way empty to fill back up. So that's something I try to live by now. I love that. Uh, Desiree, I, I kind of have the same question for you about what keeps you at your best and what you need, because you've kind of been like near your best and at your best for like a really long time. That's a whole other ball game. I mean, how do you keep that going? How do you play for so long at such a high level? What do you need to keep that going? What's important to you? Yeah, I touched on sort of the home piece wow. and getting that sort of balance between all the work and the play sort of balance of things. I need that time at home. I need a time to just like decompress, not think about soccer, connect with my friends and family and, and kind of just take a step away from the sport at times. Cause that also reignites my passion to get back on the soccer field when you can step away for a minute. Um, as well, I think just finding time within our training schedule to do stuff that is not related to soccer. I love Zumba. I love like drop in hip hop classes. So I try and mix those in the mix because it keeps things light and fresh. And I think just, yeah, for me, I'm, I would be a terrible individual sport athlete. I need to be a part of a team. And the reason I give kudos to so much of my success is because I have an amazing team and support circle behind me. My teammates are like family. We have all the WhatsApp group chats and we're connecting through our training programs in the off season. And so being able to connect and have that connection with, with my teammates and others is, is really important to me as well to keep me going day to day. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that just points me right to you, Leah. Like I'm looking at you going, you're on that bike by yourself. I know you, you do have people around you that are on your team. Talk a little bit about being an individual on that bike and, um, and keeping yourself well. And how do you, you've been doing this for a long time as well. And, and, you know, the pressure of being a professional and getting paid for what you do and being on this team, uh, what do you need to stay your best? And, and, and is there, talk about if there is any team aspect to your individual sport.
I think she's frozen. Are you on us? She's gonna come back. There she is. Are you back, <laughs> Leah? I'm back. <laughs> There we go. Did you hear my, did you hear the question? Just, to, just the no. dynamic of, just the dynamic of being an individual athlete and what supports you need and have to continue to do what you're doing with the pressure of being a professional and all that stuff. Oh, she's gone again. She keeps freezing on me. Okay. Well, we might move, we might move on. Um, but I, I, I want to go back to that because I'd love to know hours and hours on a bike by yourself. How do you keep going with that? Right. Right. You guys, like it would be, it would be tough. Like, you know, you must have really something, a strong voice in your head. Right. Um, okay. Well, ladies, uh, Desiree and uh, Emily, let, let's go to the mental health thing. You touched on that and, and you led us right into it, Emily. Thank you for doing that. Mental health has become a huge talking point right now. It's a, it's important. And I'm so glad that it has become that for us. So, um, you talked about mental well-being. What would you say, you know, either of you or any, any of the three of you can jump in on this one. What would you share about your thoughts on the importance of mental well-being and how do you stay well while striving towards reaching your goals? And I'm talking specifically in the mental health part. Big question. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can jump in since I was yeah, yeah, before. <laughs> sure. Um, I guess my thoughts on this are that high performance is only possible when you have a base of mental and physical health. And that the yeah, it's just not possible if you don't focus on the fundamentals first. Um and that yeah, personally I'm really intentional about building that self-awareness of um, yeah, where am I at? Um, what are the tools available to me? Constantly checking in. Um, and yeah, I think that's the, that's the biggest thing. And as an athlete, I think we develop so many tools for our toolbox. And that's a great thing that you learn just through sport. And if you're surrounded by, you know, if you work with a sports psychologist, or maybe you can learn it from teammates or other athletes, um, you can just constantly learn um, tools and techniques that you would you would add to that toolbox and then you know when you're what Emily said before it's like you don't want to wait until you're not doing well to um you know take care of your mental health it's it's better if you're just always practicing these things and then you know your tool is sharp when you need it <laughs> um but it's just um you know, you're starting from a higher, a higher base of, of mental well-being. Okay. Well, well, Leah, while, while we have you and, and you're still in motion, uh, we did, <laughs> we did get a question and, and a comment. Cycling is a team sport. Julie has, has uh, piped in here. Uh, it's you on the bike, but there's a team aspect to it. Each rider on the team has a job and works together to reach team goals. So that's cool. Um, and she'd love to hear uh, about, um, is there a fight to get UCI to pay the women at the same levels as the men? We're, Hey, Julie, you're getting right to the hard of stuff here. Okay. Is it, okay, where's the fight to get UCI to pay the women at the same levels as the men? And did you travel as a ski athlete and the PDP program? If so, best ski race place you went to? So there's there's three questions. Gosh, there's a lot of questions in that. Okay, so the first question was... Women getting uh, paid for what you do. Okay, women getting paid. Okay, so yes, we want to be paid the same. Um, and we've made steps. In recent years, um, there is a minimum salary now for at the women's world tour level. And in 2024, I think it's supposed to be the same as the men's. So every year they're increasing it a bit. So this was a, a huge step and we're seeing it kind of have ripple effects on the whole sport. Um, but yeah, we're still pushing that it should be for full equality in all areas and also prize money and, and yeah, yeah. We're, we're definitely pushing for equality. Cool. Uh, the next question did you travel as a ski athlete and the pdp program i did travel around canada as mm -hmm. a ski athlete um and yeah did nationals westerns easterns um actually when i went out to university i it was partially to be on um, a development ski team out of callahan valley so i was kind of going more the ski direction for a second before i went full cycling um yeah <laughs> <laughs> and my awesome. favorite the last question was the best ski place you went to. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. Um, I really love Callahan Valley. Actually, out in BC, near up near Whistler, where they had the the Olympics. I think it's just so gorgeous on a clear day, and you can see the mountains. Awesome. There's a great question also that came in uh, in the Q&A here. Thank you all for sharing your stories. I'm fascinated by firsts. First woman, first person of color, first in the family to accomplish first WNBA, that whole thing. Uh, I added that WNBA part. Um, Leah, she says, I knew you as an infant. Your grandma Fran hosted my bridal shower. That's awesome. <laughs> And you were the first person I knew personally to go to the Olympics, and it still blows my mind. How do all three of you carry your firsts? Is it a burden, a gift, or do you just go ahead and do your thing your way? Uh, you know what, Desiree, you start, and then we'll keep going. Yeah, great question. Um, I don't see it as a burden. I, I think it's huge to be represented as a Manitoban female positive role model. I kind of carry that sort of role with pride. Um, and it kind of continues me to push me to want to continue to be my best, achieve big things and sort of inspire, you know, other athletes to, to follow along the journey and, and what they can see they can be sort of thing. So for me, it's, it's a gift to me because it allows me to continue to, to push myself and want to be a positive role model and, and continue making it those first so people can, can follow along on the journey. Awesome. Emily, how about you? And, and what was that moment like when you like, hello, WNBA, what, like, and how do you carry it? Yeah, I think in the moment, you sometimes don't always realize it. It takes time and reflection, stepping back to realize like, okay, I actually did that. Um, but for me, it's definitely a gift. And I've seen just in my lifetime, how much the game of basketball has grown in Manitoba. And I see so many more club teams and more girls playing. And anytime I'm at home or I'm running a camp or working out with girls, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're miles ahead of where I was, mm -hmm. which is amazing. That's what we want. We want more people um, falling in love with the game and seeing that you can go play, you can go play professionally, you can make it to the WNBA and hopefully like me doing some of those things inspires others to also continue to do that. I, I don't want to be the only, I might be the first, but you know, I want there to be tons after me and better than me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and Leah, you know, you just go ahead and do things your way, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. First of all, that's, that's a really cool story from Liz that she knew my grandma. That's really nice. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think it's also a bit like Emily that maybe in the moment I don't, realize the significance of maybe what I've done or that it is the first time somebody did that um, but it's really in reflection and reflect yeah seeing the progress that's made now compared to say when I started that yeah it kind of puts things in perspective and you can really yeah re realize the significance of that first yeah fantastic another great question has followed Jane is asking she's saying sport and media in the media is dominated by men's sports that's not new news hockey football all that or so it seems um she asks do you find your sport is covered sufficiently and is that even important to you and what could be done to promote women in sport in the media to encourage other women to participate in your sport um so I mean a great order we might as well start with Desiree you recovered great at the Olympics but I I mean, otherwise, you know, um, there's your question. Yeah, I think um, definitely room for improvement in women's sport. I want to be able to turn on the TV and be able to find, you know, just as easily the men's sport as you can the women's. And I find that's we're not on par in that sense. Um, obviously, for major tournaments, we get that coverage. But I want our club games to be on TV. I want people to be able to see what we're doing week in, week out. We're playing every weekend. And I know there's definitely an interest in women's sport. Um, so it's just about getting that investment back into it. I think people would watch if it was available to, to the public. Um, there's definitely an audience for it. I think social media is huge. I think, you know, I'm very active on Instagram and Twitter. And I think just by us promoting and allowing people to see, you know, we have a game this weekend and putting out our schedules and we are in that media, social media age that we, if we can push it and get people the message out and, and that sort of thing, um, hopefully the investment sticks because there's definitely an audience for it. It's just a matter of getting us out there. Yeah. I don't remember the number, but there was some ridiculous number that watched that gold medal game of yours. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> So I think there's a market for so anyone's watching right now. That's how many people are want to watch women's sports. Okay. Uh, Emily, how about you? Like, do you feel, I mean, interesting, right? You go sort of across the ocean, you see it's different in Europe, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. 
Um, it's definitely different. And I think, I mean, in terms of the WNBA, we've seen in the last few years, um, much more people watching, much more people interested in it. Um, and you shouldn't have to dig and search to find it. That's a barrier to a lot of people. People are like, oh, I don't wanna watch women's sports and the tired old same jokes about women. But if it's not accessible and there's not good marketing done, then how can they see it? How can they find it? Um, Canada Basketball just announced a couple of days ago, they're doing a new partnership with Sportsnet, which is really oh. cool. And that's who's going to be showing all of the games like men's and women's like leading up to the next Olympics. So you're gonna be able to turn on the TV and see like a sports games, you don't have to go find some random obscure live stream online to be able to see it. So I think that's a really great step forward and, and it'll be a great partnership and hopefully give more exposure. So people, yeah, can just be like, oh, there's a game on TV, like, and just be able to easily access women's sports, I think is a huge thing that needs to continue to improve still. Yeah, yeah. I had a cool conversation with someone just the other day, just a little something to add here is the WNBA, a lot of NBA players are going to WNBA games. And really, I think as women, we need to work together with these men because we need their support, right? It's interesting. We don't need to fight against them. We need to work with them. And I think that was huge because these guys from the are supporting, right, WNBA and, you know, okay, so maybe the cameras are coming to say, hey, look who's at the game. But in the meantime, let's watch the game. And then they go, oh, this is great bass. This is great sport. And it's great to watch. And it's unique. It's different than the men's game. It's, it's, it's our game. And, and it's pretty cool. Uh, Leah, do you, do you feel like coverage for cycling? I mean, it's hard, you know, can we find you on TV? <laughs> we want to watch yeah, you. I I, it's, it's difficult. I, I mean, we have to make it easier to be a fan of women's sports and, and visibility is key and accessibility of, and coverage of the events. Um, and I can say with cycling, it is getting better. Um, they did set some new rules. So if you're a world to a race, they have to show at least an hour of coverage on television. And in Canada, you need to yeah, know the right <laughs> streaming sites to sign up for, to access it. Um, but at least we have seen that this, this is at least, they're setting some minimum standards. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it is really encouraging, like the numbers that come in but when they are showing uh women cycling on tv like some of the the numbers are on par or even more than some of the men's racing so i think that also shows that when you when you show it then then people will watch and they find it exciting and i would also argue a lot of the women's racing is more exciting than the men's because our races are shorter they're more dynamic they're less controlled like it's really good racing people just need to see it <laughs> That's cool. Uh, we're having lots of questions come in here. Um, how can wonderful role models, Jeff is asking, um, how can wonderful role models like you and the rest of us inspire more adults to get more active in sport, either on a competitive or recreational basis? That's a great question. To get adults more into not just watching you guys, but to doing it as well. Emily, what do you think? Yeah, I think for me, even now as a professional and what I like to tell like young kids, and I think it's also applicable here is it comes back to having fun for me. It's something I enjoy doing. I wouldn't be still doing this and putting in all this work if I didn't love what I do and if it wasn't fun. Um, and team sports is how I've made tons of my friends growing up, you know, it took me from like an awkward, shy kid to having the best friends that I still keep in contact with. So even if you're an adult, if you find a recreational league, you're going to be around people that enjoy the sport, whether you know it's just for fun or a little bit more competitive. It's a great way to meet people um, and be involved in your community and be active at the same time, which I think is just a great combination. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Leah, it, do you think cycling is, is growing? I think in COVID, I think bikes were sold out everywhere. Yeah, yeah I think they're still sold out. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> For sure, I've seen it at a, a, a recreational level. Uh, cycling's really exploded, which is really cool to see. And I think there's just so many benefits. I mean, physically and mentally, just being outside and there's the social aspect of cycling in a group. And it's so easy to meet so many interesting people and have these long conversations because you're just out for hours on your bike. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I try to, I mean, I guess how I try to promote it is I like to also join groups when I can or or lead some some recreational groups. Um, 
yeah, I think there's there's definitely more opportunities for for us to engage with the community and and figure out how we we can get more this adults and and young people active. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Desiree, I mean, you're very involved, uh, you know, when you are at home and getting young people more into sport and getting involved. Uh, what about adults? How can we get more adults uh, being active? Yeah, I need to host a 30 plus club soccer camp. Apparently yeah. I have had a few requests for that. So maybe that's the market I need to push for a little bit, throwing sure. some of those in there. Um, but yeah, I think what everyone said so far is, is just find something you love and run with it. I mean, getting active, whether it's walking, playing a sport, um, just finding something you enjoy doing is, is key. Um, whether you're a professional athlete or just live in your day-to-day -day life, you know, from work, find something that you enjoy. I think that's the most important bit because you'll stick with it. You'll want to do it. Um, and yeah, stay tuned for the soccer camp. For sure. Adults, <laughs> Adults listen up. <laughs> I would come too. I would go cycling with Leah Kirchman. Oh my word. That'd be awesome. We'll, we'll organize a Manitoba group ride sometime. That'd be, that'd be great. That would be, be fantastic. Yeah, just for a little bit, I'd want to just stand there and watch how fast you can go. Okay, anyway, um, here's another question. To each of you, th this is good. Coaches, I hope you're listening and all that because I, wa I want to hear this as a coach too. What are the things the coaches in your environment have done to make your training and competition a safe and welcoming place where you could reach your potential. And I think this is especially important because you, all three of you are super high level athletes. And I feel like there's a disconnect sometimes I'm adding to the question here where people think, well, yeah, you can be all nice as a coach until you get to the higher level, you know, but I would love to know, you know, um, how your coaches have made it safe and welcoming and made it possible for you to be the best that you could be. Uh, Desiree, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, I've been pretty fortunate to have some, like I said, incredible coaches, um, supporting me and again, seeing, you know, the special spark in me that at times I hadn't seen in myself. And I think had they all just taken it easy on me and, and not seen that potential, I don't think I would have been where I was, um, where I am, I should say. Um, but for me, I think it was always just having that open, honest communication, both player, coach, coach, player being able to go to each other and have a conversation, you know, what's working, what's not, what can I improve on? And, and me being able to, to bounce back with that conversation and feeling comfortable to do so. I think that was key to be just, yeah, comfortable to, to have those conversations to start really ignited the training and really adapted my programming and, and my path and journey into getting better as an athlete day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and I think again, just having someone who, who's confident and sees the potential in you. And I, and I had that throughout my entire career and just lighting the fire each day and, and seeing, you know, if I came to a training session and I was a bit sluggish or, you know, they, they picked up the slack for you. And it's that give and take relationship between a coach and a player that, that really you find that balance. And, and that's the beauty of uh, that relationship that you can build with a coach and, and really help you along the way. Cool. Cool. Emily, how about you in a sport like basketball, you gotta be pretty tough to play that game. You know, how do you have coaches that made it safe for you to play? <laughs> yeah, I think I've had every type of coach under the sun. I've had the coach that never yells. I've had the coach that screams. I've had the coach that doesn't instill confidence in you. I've had the coach that does. And everything um, that Desiree said definitely rang true with me. But one thing I thought that really blew me away, it's only happened a couple of times, is a coach asked me what I needed. Um, a lot of the time coaches are talking at you. They're the ones always giving the instruction. They're the ones in the position of authority over you. Um, but to have a coach stop and ask me what I needed from them was, I, I, I felt very, um, I don't know. I just felt like we were a little bit more equal. Um, and it was something that definitely took me aback. And I was like, wow, I never really thought to think about that. Like, thank you so much for asking. So I thought that was really cool. A coach asking you what they can do for you. Yeah. Aaliyah, how about you? Is it a little, is it a little more one-on-one? -on -one? I know there is team. We've learned that today. There's definitely team aspect to cycling. Um, but what, uh, talk about your coaches. Um, yeah, it is a bit unique in, in cycling. Like, um, I guess they could have kind of two kinds of coaches, like the one who's really giving you your training plan, but, you know, we also have our director who's at all the races and, you know, uh, working with us on tactics and driving the car behind the race and, and all that. Um, and yeah, I think I've, I've been pretty fortunate to also work with, with really good coaches that have created a, a really positive and safe environment. 
Um, and yeah, I love what Emily said with, um, I think the best coaches do, do also ask the athlete for more input and, and it's more of a collaboration rather than just, just, um, yeah, dictating the training or telling you what to do. It's like, I think also as you mature and become an older athlete, you also know maybe more of what works for you and what you need. So it's really nice when it kind of evolves into that kind of relationship. Um, I think also the best coaches have always brought back like the fun aspect. So no matter what level, like just always reminding you like that, that this should be enjoyable. There's enjoyable aspects. Um, and I think, yeah, one last important piece is like coaches who, yeah, identify those things that those strengths in yourself that maybe you don't see. And this is especially when you're younger, I think it takes time to learn like what your strengths are and what um, is unique about you. Um, so those coaches that can help you see that are pretty special. Yeah, that's so cool. Uh, the fun part, right? I mean, you're all doing it as a job. You're doing it as a job, but it has to stay fun. Or I, I, I would venture to say, even if it's not sport, whatever your job might be, right? Um, it's got to be a little, you got to have some fun doing it. You got to enjoy it. Um, okay, so there's a follow up on the adult participation question. Uh, maybe I'll just ask sort of whoever wants to jump in on that. Does the emphasis on competition discourage young folks? from continuing to participate? What do you think, Desiree? Hmm. I'm not sure how, how do you, how do you, how do you take competition out of sport entirely and still have it be sport, right? Like I'm trying to score goals. Like how can we balance that maybe? It's, it's a hard balance, I think. I think one, to get you through the door, it's because you love sport in general. I mean, I go to the soccer practice because I just love soccer. And then when you get there, it's about how you cultivate that environment to still provide that bit of fun and, and that little bit of competitive edge. I don't think you can, I personally don't think you can completely remove competition from sport. I think that just naturally comes with it. Yeah. Um, but it's how you find that balance and that blend of making it competitive and fun within that. I don't know if I have the answer for that, but I know. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one, right? I mean, it's funny because if you take the score out of sport, <laughs> everyone's keeping score anyway. <laughs> so I that's think, a very good question, yeah. Leah. Yeah. I think with maybe it's easier with a sport like cycling, where I think it is easier to maybe take the competitive part out. Um, you know, if you have the right group together on a ride and you've all agreed you're not going to race <laughs> and sprint for signs, and it's just a cohesive group and it's social. You're go riding to a cafe. Um, I think that is a, a non-competitive example of, of doing sport just for the joy of it. It gives us a, a different reason. And yes, you're right. If, if you're finding that maybe someone in your life, a young person is coming out of sport because they don't like the competitive aspect, maybe it's not, let's get the competition out of it. Let's find a sport that works for this kid, right? And that might be exactly what they need just to really blossom. Uh, we're getting, these are great questions. Okay. There's been a strong push to get more women to the elite coaching ranks. This is from David. Uh, one of the stumbling blocks seems to be the perception of competence. What are your opinions of how important the sex of the coach is versus the perception of how successful the coach might be? Anyone want to put their hand up? Yeah, I'll start with this one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's super important to to see yourself represented and I come overseas to Europe and there are very few female coaches in Europe professionally for women's basketball it's definitely male dominated I think there's last year there was one coach in our whole league um I think there might be one or two here this year but mostly my entire overseas career has been only male and I've seen the the switch um um, in college of now having more female coaches. And I think, I think the perception that women are not as competent is very off and just go and watch, you know, like I think that, um, yeah, women know what they're doing. There's some great players out there that make great coaches. There's great people out there who were never players who also make great coaches. You have male coaches that have never played a game of basketball in their life or any other sport. Um, so I don't think it has to do, you know, anything with sex. And I think um, there should be, it should be an equal playing field. And there's more women getting in specifically in the NBA as well. And I think that's great also um, in proving that you can have crossover 
but yeah, you can be equal as well. Yeah. Love that. Desiree, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, I was just, I'm just thinking about, again, the social media and you see all like in the NFL, the first female referee, there's so many first females coming through um, as of recently. And it's great to see, but it's also, again, like, like Leah said, like we need more females in coaching positions in higher, you know, organizational and managerial roles and all of those things. And I think I said it before, like what you see, you can be and having, and again, it's not for me about sex. It's about the competency and um our national team actually took some like diversity and inclusion training and they talk even about like the verbiage and the usage of words and like a job application and how you you know sort of the descriptive words you use and it kind of deters sometimes women from applying for those jobs because there's certain words that apply to women versus men and um I just think it's about you know accepting that a woman can do the job equally as a man and um again taking the sex out of it it's about the competency and who's right for the job Awesome. I'm going to move to another question um, that's in the chat here from James. Uh, Cal was such an amazing sports psychologist. Can all the panelists describe a time uh, when they had to draw on some inner strength to get through a tough time? Uh, for Desiree, I'm thinking of a couple of Olympics ago when you played the U.S. and the ref made some horrible calls. Yeah, that was a journey for sure. Um, yeah, I feel like that was yesterday. That game, 2012 semifinal, um, at a call that's never been called actually in sport, in soccer ever. Um, a six second rule on our goalkeeper changed the whole dynamic of the game. They got a free kick, ended up losing in the semis against the US. It was just crazy. Um, and for us, it was just, we had in the Olympics, you have two days to bounce back between games, which is not a ton of time. Um, so to go from like the highest of highs to then have, the lowest of lows and have two days to bounce back. It's, you do have to draw on that mental strength of rallying the team. And I just remember our captain, Christine Sinclair, um, we went in the locker room, all of us are bawling our eyes out. And she's like, take tonight to feel this because it's important um, to feel these emotions, cry, do what you need. And then tomorrow it's like, we're back to business because we're not leaving here without a medal. And um, I think it's, again, great to draw on the strength of within that team because we just, I remember looking around and everyone was just, hit rock bottom, but then having each other to one another to pick each other up and a great sports psych that was like, okay, what do you need? How do we deal with these emotions? Feel them because you need to. And then how can we flip the script and, and change your mindset to bounce back within a, within a quick span of time. And two days later, we, we won a bronze. So um, definitely a roller coaster for sure. You sure did. You sure did it. I, I want to ask each of you also this same question, inner strength. Uh, give us an example of when you use inner strength to get through a tough time, Leah. Yeah, gosh, it's hard to think of, um, yeah, just one time. I think you're constantly kind of um, dealing with, with things that you, yeah, you just need a lot of inner strength to, to um, yeah, deal with a lot of situations and move forward on things. Um, I guess, yeah, a tough time reflecting on my career um, was back in 2012 um, when I was the alternate for the Olympic team and um, I remember being really disappointed with how things went with that qualification and um, yeah, didn't feel everything was super fair. Um, and yeah, I was fortunate that I was already, I was working with, um, yeah, Adrian out of the sports center. So had had lots of tools in my psychological toolbox to, to draw from. And um, yeah, I think used that disappointment to fuel me to, into the next Olympic cycle and um, decided that I was, you know, I was going to let my legs do the talking and, and to just show that I can be the best, um, the best Canadian rider and, and deserve to, to represent Canada at the Olympics. Um, and I think it was really that, um, yeah, finding that inner strength and using that um, disappointment instead of fuel that also has kind of led me to now reach this level in this sport. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big lesson too, is like every um, disappointment or challenge that you face, it can, it can actually really be an opportunity if you, if you frame it in the right way. Mm -hmm. And Emily, we're, I mean, we're nearing, we're sort of nearing the end of our time, but I really want to know this. I think it's important and it really fits what we're talking about with Cal, with the Cal lecture series, you know, the inner stuff is a part of sport and our lives. So uh, give us, give us an example. 
Yeah, for sure. I'm going to give my most recent example, I guess, I'm going through all of them, I'll just go with the most recent. <laughs> so <laughs> last season, I was in the Czech Republic, and I was struggling um, in the fall time, we were in a full lockdown, all I could do was go to the gym, go to my apartment, everything was closed. We had a period of where we were shut down and we weren't even allowed to play games either when the pandemic was at its peak. And I was really struggling with whether I should stay or if I should go home. And I wasn't in a good place. And obviously I ended up staying, but I also wanna say that deciding to go wouldn't have been quitting either. So sometimes I think, uh, you know, when players transfer, when players retire or stop playing, we think of it as quitting. And I think that can be um, really hard to deal with mentally. So me deciding to stay, I mean, that just ended up being my decision, but it wasn't any type of inner strength that I personally drew on. I, I think I kind of realized that my inner strength is my support system around me. So it doesn't always have to come from me. It can come from sports psychologists, from, you know, people I have in my life, whether it be my mom or close friends or anybody else. You know, I have my list of people that I know I can go to and people that are in my corner. Um, so yeah, I think sometimes my, my inner strength is knowing when to reach out for help. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's so important as we sort of leave this, I feel like we're leaving so much on the table and we could just be here for hours. But I think what I'm really hearing from each of you is, is the teams that surround you are so important. So never underestimate. I don't know what chair that whoever you are listening today, whatever chair you're sitting in, whether you're, you are an athlete or you're a coach or you're a support system or you're a parent, or you're someone who wants to be one of these three women, you know, and that's your goal. And that's your dream. Um, take support from those who are offering it, ask for help when you need it. It's not weakness, it's strength. And I think that's where our, our high performance, um, you know, consultants, whatever we want to call them, you know, our sports psychologists that are right next to us, we can use them I and mean, take them along with us. And they, they hold us up from the inside out. And it's not because we're weak. It's because we're going to be stronger with, with a whole team around us. And I've, I've heard that from each of you today. I love that. Don't wait till your tank is empty. Keep it a quarter full, smart mom. You know, um, don't be afraid to say no when it's right for you. And don't be afraid to say yes, because you wanna try. I love that. Every challenge or disappointment is absolutely an, op an opportunity. Um, and we need people who are confident in us. And we need people who communicate with us and really care what we need. And that's in every walk of life. And that brings excellence. And that brings us human beings like Desiree Scott, Emily Potter, and Leah Kirchman. You women are inspirational. I know that you will fight for your causes. You each have some. You're each giving back to your communities. We thank you for that. You've given back to us today. Uh, Cal Botterill, thank you for starting this. Thank you for being who you are. And for, you know, this, this is named after you for a reason. And we appreciate, you know, all that you give. Uh, Dr. Adrian Leslie Tugood, this wouldn't happen without her. And incredible. Congrats again to Craig Brown. Um, and, and thank you. You're, you're just starting out on an incredible journey. And uh, you're an incredible human being helping others be the same. Big thanks to the Canadian Sports Centre of Manitoba. Uh, that's where I'm sitting right now. And uh, what a great organization uh, making a big difference for our Canadian athletes. Um, so uh, ladies, thank you. Before I let you all go, I just want to let you know that the annual Bison Transport Lead Hership Series um, is, is coming up. It's designed to empower and inspire women and girls to become leaders in sport, community, and life. This year's free five-part online series brings together inspirational leaders from all areas of sport to tell their personal and professional stories. Uh, they'll offer valuable advice and guidance and practical tips for anyone who takes part. Uh, the next session of the Bison Transport Sport Leadership Series, uh, titled Calling the Shots and Leading the Way, is on December 15th, 2021 at noon, where you'll hear from three powerful and innovative women, head coach of the uh, ex-women basketball program at St. Francis Xavier University and founder of Black Canadian Coaches Association, Liana Osei, um, former University of Manitoba Athletic Director and Women's Basketball Coach, Colleen Dufresne, and uh, our host, for the Lead Her Ship series is TSN sports reporter and amazing female herself, Sarah Orleski. So if you wanna register for that, go to sportmanitoba.ca slash leadership 2021-22.
Okay. So I got that in for you. There you go. Yes, I was reading that. So amazing things are happening for females in sport and amazing things overall for all of us, for our wellness. Desiree, thank you. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you so much. It was a great chat and so great to hear everyone's stories and super inspired. I feel like going to the gym now and getting after it. So great yeah, chat. Thank you for flying the flag. We, we just love it. Leah Kirchman, thanks for enlightening us on cycling and uh, on, I was, can I, I don't know if I can say kick ass woman uh, doing what you're doing um, overseas and here in Canada. So thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. And yeah, I loved hearing, hearing what the other ladies are up to as well and, and hearing what it's like in, in um, yeah, the other world of sport that's not cycling. <laughs> It's yeah, cool. And Emily Potter, you know, all the way out in Greece, thanks for taking the time to join us for sacrificing a bit of your practice time. Say thanks to your coach and your teammates for us. And uh, I guess, you know, keep your shorts on and go outside and have a nice time in the sunshine. Thanks <laughs> yes, for joining. Thank you. Thank you for enjoying uh, letting me join. It was great. Um, and I'll go. Uh, I'll soak up the warm weather for all of us. <laughs> Perfect. We'll live vicariously through you. Desiree, Emily, Leah, what a great panel. Thank you again for joining us, for your questions, for your encouraging notes now. And uh, we just appreciate that you have been a part of this. And uh, thanks, Canadian Sports Centre and more. This has been the Cal Botterill Legacy Lecture Series for 2021. Uh, and it's been amazing. Thanks for joining us.